Chapter 22 Recent torch cinders marked the steps, and there were smoke stains on the ceiling. The steps were smooth and regular and steep, and we came to four landings. The air was fresh, but rather moist, and Moonboy said he could hear water. Finally, I could too. And as we arrived at the last step, our torchlight reached out to an underground river. The story of Wolf flashed through my mind. The water was jet black because of the rock bed it ran through, and on the other side was something huge and dark. It made no movement or sound. I bent down and swung my torch until I found the right angle, and light bounced across the water to an enormous stone statue. It was of a man and the features were rather familiar. Yen Wang Ye, the first, the former First Lord of Hell, Master Li said in a normal tone of voice. There's no need to whisper, you know. Our torchlight will have already announced our presence. He studied the statue thoughtfully. The representation of a guardian of the dead suggests that the cavern actually is an extension of the tomb of the Laughing Prince, as we had assumed. Considering the fact that the bastard tunneled under most of the valley, he may have built the largest tomb in history. The cavern was immense. Our torchlight barely reached the ceiling. The slap of our sandals echoed away in the darkness and came bouncing back in a distorted manner, as though filtered through a maze of side tunnels. Master Lee started off upstream while I clutched my axe and glared ferociously at the shadows. Grief of Dawn's bow swung back and forth behind us, with a notched arrow ready. <clears throat> Spaced at about two hundred foot intervals were more huge stone statues. Master Lee identified the strangely named Emma Hu, the Japanese King of the Dead, and muttered something about the Laughing Prince having listed deities from every culture he could think of. Many of the figures Master Lee couldn't identify but he bowed deeply to a strong young hero who was holding a captured lion, and as he walked on he began chanting under his breath. I caught part of it. In the house of dust lives lord and prophet, wizard and priest, and Gilgamesh, whom gods have anointed in death. Great was his glory, great was his pride. Dust is his nourishment, and his food is mud. "'Doesn't sound very heroic to me,' I muttered. "'Dear boy, the story of Gilgamesh makes our epics of the heroic quest "'look like scribblings of half-witted children,' Master Lee said sternly. "'I was in no position to argue with him. "'The next statues were Egyptian underworld deities, "'and there were an extraordinary number of them. "'I nearly jumped out of my sandals when the torchlight picked up a huge threatening mummy, "'holding some kind of hideous creature, but Master Lee said it wasn't intended to represent the Laughing Prince, "'but Osiris and the monster Amemet. "'He identified a god with the head of a jackal as Anubis, "'and a lady with a feather as Ament, "'but he seemed to be looking for something else.' Finally, he stopped and pointed. Toth, he said. Grief of dawn, in your delirium you said, There's the Ibis statue, and here he is. What we're looking for, incidentally, is a statue with the head of a raven. The only sounds were the lapping of water and the slapping of sandals and the hiss of torches. The shattered emptiness seemed infinite. I felt the cold chill of eternity pressing down on me, and I clutched my axe tighter. Statue after statue, secretive, monstrous, eternally guarding the mummy of a laughing madman whose coffin was empty. I would not have been surprised to hear deadly shrieking squeals and see seven black bats flapping overhead. Master Lee grunted with satisfaction. Moonboy had bounced torchlight across the water to another statue. It was a woman whose head was that of a raven. I have no idea what she represents, but Grief of Dawn said, There's the raven and the river, and just before that she said, There's the god statue. We can assume that she had just come in sight of the river, so start looking for a side passage. If we don't find one here, we'll try the other bank. We were on the right side. Sixty feet farther on we found a side passage with steps leading up, and on the first landing was a statue of a deity with a goat's head and horns. 
We reached countless landings, and I was willing to bet that we had climbed far above the level of the valley, and were inside one of the hills. Finally, the steps came to an end. We had reached a semicircular marble floor like that of an anteroom. Four iron doors were set into the stone wall, and beside each one was a stone statue with a porcelain jar in its hands. "'Back to Egypt,' said Master Lee. "'These represent the four sons of Horus, whose jars hold organs removed during embalming. The one with the human head is Imsti, who protects the liver. Doghead Happy protects the lungs, jackalhead Duamore protects the stomach, and hawkhead Kebsnuf protects the intestines.' He scratched his nose thoughtfully. The style isn't Egyptian, but Chinese, and I wonder if the Laughing Prince had a different symbolism in mind. Happy's head resembles that of the celestial dog, and perhaps the Laughing Prince felt he deserved a bodyguard equal to that of the Emperor of Heaven. Not everything was stone and rigid, so Master Lee reached out and lifted the jar from the statue's hands. The rest of us jumped backward as the door beside the statue slid open. The prince jammed his spear in the frame to keep the door from accidentally closing. We lifted our torches and stepped inside, and Grief of Dawn and Moon Boy cried out in wonder. They hadn't seen it before, but we had. We were back inside the formal tomb, and the door was so neatly hidden in the wall that we would never have found it. Now we knew how fresh air could get in, and a mummy in a jade suit could be carried out. There was no sign or sound of merry, mel merry fellows dressed up in motley. Nothing had been taken since we had been there. When we looked into the room where the skeletons of poisoned concubines lay, in their beds, I saw tears trickle down the cheeks of Grief of Dawn. Once she had laughed and cried with these girls, and one terrible day she had run away with one of them. What must it have been like to live in the shadow of Tao Wan? and to be at the command of a lunatic torturer and murderer like the Laughing Prince. Looming over all of them had been the strange power of a mysterious stone, and Master Lee had the stone in mind as he led the way to the burial chamber and the exposed mummy of Tao Wan. "'Ox, see if you can get the jade plates away from the skull,' he said. It was a slow process. But finally I managed to break the gold wire at the corners of one of the plates, and after that it went more quickly. White bones appeared, and then I let out a howl of terror and jumped four feet backward. I know nothing of embalming, but somehow the hair had survived. I thought it was a living creature as it bulged out between cracks. I got hold of myself <laughs> and removed the last plates. Master Lee reached out and withdrew the hairpin and a lustrous black lock, shocking against the bare white bone, slid over my hand like a snake. Master Lee swore the tip of the hairpin had been snapped clean off. The sliver is gone, the piece of stone from the sacristy is gone, and if the Laughing Prince used the third piece for an amulet, hell, he's gone, Master Lee snarled. He scratched his head and frowned. Odd? "'Something deep inside my mind had expected this,' he muttered. "'In hell I had Tao Wan say that the stone from her pin had been stolen, "'possibly by her maid. "'Why did I suspect the sliver was gone?' "'We had no answer, of course, and Master Lee finally shrugged and started back to the exit. "'At any rate, we know for certain that the stone was taken before she was encased in jade, "'which leads us back to the monks of mirth, "'who very probably provided perverted prayers at her deathbed.' If the order has continued to this day, hidden down here in a cavern, they've had all three pieces of the stone for more than 750 years. What in the name of Buddha have they been doing with it? It was another unanswerable question. We went back out to the semicircular anteroom, and Master Lee replaced the jar in the hands of the statue, and the door slid shut. The next statue was the one with the head of a jackal. Master Lee said that jackals meant many things to ancient Egyptians, but that the symbolism here was probably Chinese, and we should keep tight hold on our stomachs. He lifted the second jar, and the second door slid open, and when we walked inside his warning wasn't good enough. 
Both Moon Boy and Grief of Dawn threw up, and the Prince and I were close to it. It was another medical research center, but even worse than the grotto. The dry air had better preserved the graphically illustrated experiments painted on the walls, and it was harder than ever to believe that any man could do such things to human beings. Prince Liu Pao couldn't take his eyes from the iron cages. Skeletons of peasants lay there, patiently awaiting their turn to entertain the laughing prince. Master Li's attention was drawn to the charts and formulas that annotated the experiments. Qi and Shi, the life and motion forces that animate the universe, he said matter-of-factly. He was using an extraordinary stone to chart the pe energy patterns of life as it slowly drained from the bodies of dying peasants. The man who could master the flow of energy would become a god, of course, and if he had also used ideal breathing to create the embryonic pearl, he would be immortal. Show me a quest for personal immortality, and I'll show you a path through a slaughterhouse, and the incense of personal divinity is the stench of other people's corpses. Ox, when I decay to the point where I start dabbling with potency potions and the elixir of life, lead me to the Eye of Tranquility and hand me a fishing pole and a jar of worms. He led the way back out and closed the door behind us. The third door was guarded by Kepschnuf, the hawk-headed, and the hawk is the hunter. The monks of mirth would have to go out and grab more peasants, and Master Lee said it would be a good idea to see if there were other exits, in case we had to get out fast. The door slid open, and we walked into a long tunnel, lined with side passages. Master Lee ignored the side passages, and continued down the tunnel until we reached a dead end. Then he started back to check the passages, one by one. When we turned around, Prince Liu Pao took the lead and confidently stepped into the first dark opening. He disappeared. Ah! The scream of terror dropped down and down, echoing ever deeper in the depths of the earth, and then it faded away. The silence was more frightening than the scream. I forced my feet to move. Apparently the prince hadn't been paying attention to his sandals, because a black pit opened in the floor just inside the entrance. I knelt and thrust my torch down. The drop wasn't vertical. A smooth stone chimney sloped down through solid rock as slick and even as packed snow. I remembered how the prince had nursed Grief of Dawn, and I saw his warm, glorious paintings glowing before my eyes. I sat down and slid my legs over the edge. "'Can you see him?' Master Lee asked. "'No, sir, but I will,' I said grimly. I pushed off before anyone could stop me. Moon Boy yelled, and then all I heard was the air whistling past my ears as I picked up speed. The slick stone was faster than the ice on Boar's Head Hill behind my village. The flame of my torch was streaking behind me like the flags on racing boats during the Dragon Boat Festival, and I shot through another curve, sailed up the smooth wall almost to the ceiling, and skidded back to the center groove at ninety miles an hour. Even in my terror, I felt the thrill of excitement. I shot around another curve and sailed up the smooth bank and back down to the center again, and the wild exhilaration of the ride was furthered by the fact that I was racing into pitch blackness, and for all I knew, the chimney was going to branch into a pair of six-inch holes with a jagged fanged rock in the center. The speed was incredible. I careened like a comet around three more curves, and then the slope leveled and lifted, and I was shooting upward, and then the chimney came to an abrupt end. The next thing I knew, I was flying out into the air, and water was rushing beneath me, and I just had the wit to, curl, to hurl my torch ahead before I plunged down and splashed into a river. I came to the surface spouting water and paddled to the bank. Pitch is hard to put out, and my torch lay there, still burning. I had come back to the central cavern and the Black River, and I lifted the torch and jumped back in and paddled to the other bank. I walked up and down, peering upward, and finally I saw the black hole I had come flying out of. It's, I'm all right, I yelled. I don't see the prince, but I'll find him. I began slowly walking along the bank, looking for wet marks where the prince had climbed out, or been carried out. 
I didn't want to think of him landing on the back of his neck or striking a submerged rock. A sound made me whirl around, raising my axe. I should have expected it. Master Lee was flying through the air. He hit the water like a cormorant, and Grief of Dawn came flying after him and landed like a swan. Moonboy couldn't do anything that wasn't graceful, and he reminded me of a great dancer at the opera, as he turned a somersault, touched his toes, and split the water as cleanly as a knife-blade. I helped drag them out and collected their torches and relit them from mine. <coughs> ah, Buddha, what a toy, Master Lee said, pounding the side of his head to force water from his ears. The man who could duplicate that ride in the public parks would be a, mandar a mandarin inside of a month. Mandarin? Emperor, Moonboy said enthusiastically. I only hope the prince enjoyed it as much as I did, Grief of Dawn said somberly. Master Lee was looking for something, and he found it. Ancient iron brackets were set in the wall leading up to the hole of the chimney. Nature rarely produces something that smooth, and I suspect that nature had some help, he said. The river was used to transport heavy objects to this point. They were hoisted to the hole, and windlasses hauled them on sleds up through the rocks to the higher level of the tomb. There should be a staircase very close. We soon found it. Master Lee wanted only to be sure that there were steps if we needed them, and then we began to search for Prince Liu Pao. We walked up and down the bank, and were about to cross to the far bank, when Grief of Dawn's sharp eyes found what we had missed. It was a small scarlet tassel. "'The prince's tunic has scarlet tassels at the bottom,' she said excitedly. We widened the search, and sixty or seventy feet upstream, we found another tassel. "'They've got him,' Master Lee said flatly. If he were free, he would have yelled as Ox did, and he would have immediately looked for a way back up and found that staircase. We have to assume that he's been grabbed by our friends in the funny robes, but has enough movement to leave a trail. At regular intervals we continued to find the tassels that the prince had surreptitiously torn off. Then they stopped. We doubled back, and finally found a side passage that was almost invisible behind a jutting shelf of rock. Another tassel lay just inside the entrance, but Master Lee brought us to a halt. His eyes were bleak as he examined the tunnel. Ancient wooden supports and scaffolding were everywhere, er, and the floor was littered with rocks that had fallen from the ceiling. It was a death trap, and the prince wouldn't conceivably have entered it unless he was being carried. Master Lee lowered his voice. "'Moon boy, this is your department,' he whispered. Rather nasty gentlemen may be back in there, and I'd like them to hear us enter without us actually entering. Moonboy nodded. He sat down at the entrance and took off his sandals, and placed his spear so he could scrape it against the wall with his shoulder. Shh, quiet, Master Lee whispered, except it wasn't Master Lee, but Moonboy, pitching his voice into the tunnel. The sandals in his hands moved rapidly and lightly, and four pairs of feet seemed to move into the tunnel. "'I don't see anything,' my voice whispered. "'I don't either,' Grief of Dawn's voice whispered. "'All clear this way,' Moon Boy whispered in his own voice. The sandals were gradually hitting the floor harder, as though the people wearing them were coming closer. Moon Boy moved his shoulder and produced a metallic scrape from the spear, followed by a muffled curse in the voice of Master Lee. "'Is that another tassel?' my voice whispered, louder. Deep in the darkness of the tunnel was a sharp snapping sound, followed by the screech of splintering wood. We heard a great crash. The floor shook, and waves rippled across the river, and dust and wood splinters billowed from the tunnel mouth. Crash followed crash, as though the entire ceiling was collapsing. And it was a long time before the noise stopped, and the echoes faded away. Good, Master Lee said quietly. Officially, we're dead, pulverized like corn beneath a grindstone. And they won't be looking for us when we pay them a call. Fortunately, they shouldn't be hard to find.